This lecture is on hematology, hema, blood, ology, the study of, and that's what we're going to do. Is And we've talked about all the components all semester, but we're going to really get down to it today. And the lecture is going to be divided into terms and definitions. That'll be the first part of it. Terms and definitions, and they'll be just interchanged. The um, second part of it will be disorders, problems that happen to the blood. And then uh, the third aspect will be tests that we run that tell us what's going on in the blood with the blood. And then the fourth is medical and nursing treatment that we hadn't already discussed. So terms and definitions, disorders, uh, tests and treatments, medical and nursing. And I always like to start out with um, uh, kind of a just a regular type beginning and saying that the term blood conjures up emotions. You see blood, it's a little bit emotional. You hear the word, it's a little emotional. And um, we know that in Christianity, people discuss nothing but the blood of Christ. Judaism, uh, the blood of the Passover is a big, was a big deal. Uh, historians stirred up the people by saying um, uh, things about blood. And, and George Patton was called blood and guts. And he was certainly an emotional uh, innovator. Prime ministers talked to the people and said um, that they would win the war through blood, sweat, toil, and tears. So I always say, try to get a laugh, um, my goal today is um, not to stir your emotions by talking about blood. It's to simply give you the bloody facts. I think that's kind of cute. I hope you do too. All right, let's start with some of the data, terms, definitions regarding blood. And you know that um, we've already said what hematology means. Um, hemopoietic means the making of blood. We have areas of the body that are hemopoietic. Um, there are seven functions of the blood. You probably don't even have to write them down. I'm not going to have you regurgitate. I just want you to realize that there are uh, seven different um, functions of blood. It carries oxygen. It um, is an o uh, carbon dioxide transporter and remover. And it removes metabolic waste. It uh, carries hormones. It protects against infection. It requires body temperature. It regulates body temperature and carries food from the GI tract uh, nutrition. So it has seven wonderful functions and you do not need to memorize them or learn them because you know that's what blood does, those seven things. I just kind of talked about them, but you know what they are. Um, Let's get real straight that uh, blood is made of two, two components, plasma and cells. And 55% of our blood is plasma. And I want you, I do think it's important because in taking care of patients to realize about plasma and blood, I mean in cells. So 55% of blood is plasma. And that's no cells in it. It's just plasma. It's 98% water. And it's got fibrinogen, which helps with clotting. It's got albumin. And albumin, remember, pulls fluid. When we talked about shock, we talked about albumin is what pulls fluid from tissue that's excess and pulls it out into the uh, vascular system and hopefully get rid of it through the kidneys. So we've got albumin, we've got um, 
water, we've got fibrinogen, and then uh, gamma globulin. And gamma globulin is our antibodies that are in the that are in our blood that we've acquired through disease or through gifts uh, of our on the maternal side of our life. But um, that's what makes up plasma. Water, 98%. Fibrinogen, albumin, gamma globulin. Now, cells, 45%. Then you can say, what's the other five? But well, that's 100. 45% um, of our blood are cells. Now, let's get this real clear and straight. There are three type cells, and you say, oh, I know those. Get it really straight. They really do not do anything together. They live in the same place, which is blood. But they each have a function that is, doesn't care what the other one's doing particularly. They just do their own thing. And of course, they, uh, that involves red cells, which are called erythrocytes, white cells, leukocytes, and platelets, thrombocytes. And I know you've had this in anatomy and physiology, but I just want to review it so we all are together. And of course, red cells deal with nutrients and oxygen. White cells deal with infection and fighting. And thrombocytes deal with clotting. And for the most part, that's what I want you to remember. Platelets will have a little effect with infection. They, if called upon, platelets can help a little bit, but I'd rather you keep in mind the main functions of the three cells, knowing that platelets can veer off and help a little with infection. For the most part, platelets clotting, white is infection fighting, red is uh, nutrients and uh, oxygen. And let's get another thing that will make me so happy. If you'll understand the word anemia. Anemia is a low amount of red cells. Red only. So don't turn your paperwork in saying the white cells are low because they're anemic. White has to do with infection. It doesn't have to do with red. Red is only uh, to deal, the term anemia only deals with red. And get that really in your head because it, it'll embarrass me at the school when you go around saying that white cells mean anemia. Red equals anemia. Their um, blood is formed, and I'm going to talk more about the cells, but blood is formed in the bone marrow, the spleen, the liver, and uh, in utero uh, and early age, bone marrow in the vertebrae, in the sternum, in the pelvis all make red cells. As we get older, only our long bones uh, deal with bone, with blood forming. Uh, we can, um, and you know, our blood goes to capillaries and then turns right around and comes back, and you know that. Well, and they say we're only as healthy as our capillaries because um, that's where the transport happens. And if, if there can't be a transport, then we've got a break in our system. And um, the best place to know how our vascular system looks because our capillaries indicate how, our, how healthy our vascular system is. So we can tell how healthy our vascular system is by looking at the retina. Because if you've ever looked in the retina in your anatomy and physiology, you see the disc, the optic disc, with the vessels off the sides and if they're bulbous and, and look blown up or swollen, they're not of great integrity. If they look good and straight, then our whole vascular system, it's a window truly into our body. 
Um, the term sepsis, we've already talked about it. We've talked it in several areas, burns and then our shock. And I think most of you know there's an official definition. You don't necessarily have to write it down. If you just say to yourself, it's so much bacteria or viruses in our blood that the good blood cannot get to organs. If you'll just say that to yourself, don't go tell a physiologist that. But if you can just say to yourself, it's so crowded out, good blood is so crowded with bacteria, it, you're septic. In other words, and here's a fancy definition, decreases tissue perfusion secondary to an invasion in the circulatory system related to bacteria or viruses. Poly, many, cythemia, cy, cell, emia, blood. Poly, blood, poly, cells in the blood. Polycythemia, usually emia, or means, polycythemia, means increasing red cells. I want you to know, and when you see it in your book, polycythemia vera, V-E-R-A, they say it's an increase in all the three cells. And it can be, and it, I mean, that's the definition of the word. I just don't want you to get hung up on those two words, polycythemia vera and polycythemia, because the medical community pretty much uses them interchangeably. Just polycythemia means red or solid polycythemia can be more than red. Just look at the lab work and see what they're really saying. If all three are down, they're probably calling it vera. Or they may be just calling it polycythemia. But the point is, uh, the medical community does use it interchangeably. Um, if... Uh, the liver, if, the, if red blood cells are low in your count, in your blood, the liver can step up and, and start making um, red cells. I told you, our bone, mar our bone forming organs are bone marrow, spleen, and liver. Liver doesn't do a lot of it, but it can. It can uh, step it up. I think I read one time, um, eight times more than it normally does if called upon to. I didn't mention kidneys, but erythropoietin and kidneys, I think most of you all have studied that because I can tell from your paperwork that you realize uh, red cells are made, the kidneys help with that, the making of red cells with erythropoietin. Um, I want you to know the lymphatic system is a big part of the hemopoietic system and our lymphatic system is made up of the spleen, tonsils, lymph nodes, and the thymus, the, the part of our, the little organ that makes our T cells. You already know, we have 10 pints of blood, five liters of blood in our body. We lose 20% or two pints, our, our life is in danger. And, and this is a good time to bring up edema uh, I just want to bring it up. I don't think I brought it up again, but I'll just repeat if I have. Edema uh, can go from one plus to anasarca to brawny. And uh, one plus, I tell students, because this is works for me, if I'm working and assessing somebody and I look at their feet or their hands and I just have to study it a minute and say to myself, I think it, I think it's swollen. If that's what I'm saying to myself, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's swollen. It's probably a one plus. Two and three plus are hard to distinguish and I don't care. Um, four plus is um, pitting, swollen and pitting. When you're, no question they're swollen, an edematous and you press down and it pits, makes the pit. That's four plus. Brawny. B-R-O-B-R-A-W-N-Y is the skin is so shiny that it won't pit. Do you know they're swollen, but they're so tight they don't even pit, and they may be weeping just a little bit. That's brawny. Anasarca, Anasarca, I think it's in your briefs, pits, makes the pit. 
that's four plus. Brawny, B R O, B R A W N Y, is the skin is so shiny that it won't pit. Do you know they're swollen? But they're so tight they don't even pit, and they may be weeping just a little bit. That's brawny. Anna Sarka, Anna Sarka, I think it's in your briefs, is generalized edema. It's not just the feet. They are just generalized edematous. It's Anna Sarka. Um, erythrocytes, we've already said, are red blood cells. Leukocytes, white. Thrombocytes are platelets. Um, poesis, uh, erythropoiesis is the making of red cells. Hemopoiesis or hemopoietic are the making of all blood cells. And then I want us to know ptosis for the ending of a word and penia for the ending of a word. So erythrosi, erythros red in Greek. Psi is cell, ptosis is increase. So when you see erythrocytosis, it's an increase in red cells. Penia is the opposite, P-E-N-I-A, low. Erythrocypenia is erythro, red, cells, penia. Thrombocytopenia, thromboclot, cyta, cell, penia, down. The clotting cells are down. The platelets are down. So ptosis is up. Penia is down when you ever deal with those words. Um, then, um, normal WBCs, you know, are what, 5,000 to 10,000 or whatever, 4.5, whatever, 4,500 or whatever you've learned that, that's on your card, your laminated card. And I want you just to remember there are five different types, and then you've had this in anatomy and physiology, but I want to go over it again. You've had five different types of white cells because they fight different things, different battles for you. And uh, it's easy. Basophils, uh, basophils fight blood problems. And you don't have to know norms on them because they're, you don't use it that much as far as checking. And this, the five, is called a differential. So if the physician asks for a differential, they're asking that the white cells be broken down to see which is the highest, which might lead them to know which, what is causing this infection, this inflammation. So basal fields mean there's a blood problem, like leukemia, a blood dyscrasia. Eosinophils, E-O, Sin feels means there's probably an allergy, an allergic reaction. White blood cells have ro risen to fight an allergy. Lymphocytes, lymphocytes are if they're elevated, there has been there's a virus. That's one reason a physician is trying to see if it's a virus or bacteria. So uh, WBCs that are lymphocytes that are high in in the differential mean there's a virus problem. Uh, monocytes, monocytes, the fourth type, they, mostly the books say we don't really know what they do, they clean up. They're good cleaner uppers and they clean up for about anybody. Uh, they can clean up for basal fields, any of those. They're pretty good cleanups, uh, especially for uh, viral and bacterial uh, fighting WBCs that have done their due, they'll help clean up. Again, not too sure. The books aren't too sure. Mm -hmm. The final one is neutrophils, which fight bacteria. That's your fifth one. And that neutrophils fight bacteria. Now, they, they come in different words, neutrophils do, and so uh, Learn them all because it's your facility. Whatever your hospital is will be what, which of those titles for, and listen to me, adult fighting bacterial WBCs. Adult fighting neutrophils, 
polysegmented neutrophils. Segmented neutrophils and polysegmented neutrophils. I think that gets them all. Polymorpha, polymorpha new, segmented neutrophils, so polymorphs, polymorphs they call them. Segs, polysegmented neutrophils, or polysegs. Any of those that I rattled off in every combination are adult fighting bacterial WBCs. And I say adult, all the other four were already adults, but neutrophils begin early and we're able to see if them form as young neutrophils or segmented neutrophils. And the youngest of all bacterial fighting are called jubes or juveniles. J-U, juveniles, the word juvenile, means they're the youngest bacterial fighting WBCs. I call them the babies. Then the teenagers, or the next level, are the um, bands or segs. Uh, bands or stabs, I'm sorry. Bands, B-A-N-D-S, or stabs, S-T-A-B-S. Either name, whatever hospital. And they're the, the middle, not middle age, I kind of call them teenagers, from juves to bands and sex, stabs to polymorphs, polysegs, segs, neutrophils, polysegmented neutrophils. So they grow up. And if you are looking at a differential at the hospital, you may realize that I don't see any differential. Maybe they didn't order it. If they ordered it and it's all in normal range, I didn't give you any ranges to learn, then they're saying it's, that it says isn't distinguished. Or they may just give you one. If they just give you lymphocytes and none others, they're saying the lymphocytes are high and it's probably a viral infection. Now, some hospitals will give you the, one of the younger ones. No hospital uses both youngers, not bands and juveniles or stabs and juveniles. They give you one young because that's all you need to compare to the older. So if you do get a differential, and I'm not giving norms because it's no reason to learn it. You've got your computer sheet. Here is neutrophils, the adult, and they're high. We'll say they're high. Neutrophils are high. But you look and your juves are normal, then what tells you is that the body has made enough extra that it has now told the bone marrow, you can go back to normal production. We've got the army that'll take care of this infection. Now, if polymorphs, adult, are normal and bands or stabs, whatever your hospital uses, are high, the infection is just starting. This bacterial infection is just starting because these can't just pop up instantly. They have to send a message to the bone marrow, listen, we've got an infection, it's bacterial. Would you make some more uh, neutrophil potential, which would be bands or stabs or juveniles? So that's your differential. And if you don't understand, we'll, talk, we'll have class time and we can talk about it. Um, now, if WBCs are over 20,000, 10,000, when they get over 10,000 or 20,000, we have a pretty big infection going on. But is it viral, is it allergy, allergy or is it uh, bacterial? And that's what a differential of the physician is at all. Now, if they have a big gaping uh, purulent sore, they probably know it's bacterial, no reason to do a differential. Uh, if, if, they're, if WBCs are 30,000, 40,000, they look at leukemia because we're going to get to leukemia in a few minutes and leukemia is leuka, meaning white, emia in the blood. And leukemia is high white cells, but the problem is they're no good. 
you think, oh, that's wonderful to fight infection. They're no good. They're not good fighters. They're just fragments. And that is, of course, the definition of leukemia. CBC, you have it on your laminated card. It's uh, hematocrit, hemoglobin, white cells, red cells, and sometimes platelets. CBC and a differential is just what I've said has to be ordered. Uh, stem cells, these are just terms I want you to know, stem cells are young, immature, uh, blood cells that haven't decided which there are yet. They're so young they haven't decided if they're white, red, or platelets. A reticular cell, a reticular site, reticular site are immature red cells. And if your body has a lot more than normal, again, you don't need to know the norm, but if your body has way more than normal, then is your bone marrow functioning? It's not normal. Did I say normal? If it has a low amount of, of immature or has a lot of immature or not enough, it tells you what's going on with the bone marrow. Hemolysis, hemolysis, break down blood. It's breaking down mostly the red cells is what it does. Our clotting factors, there are 13 of them. You don't need to know them. You just need to know we have 13 factors that help us clot, and if we don't have all 13, we don't clot well. Um, WBCs can live a minute, uh, an hour, uh, days, weeks, months, and even years white blood cells can and that's why uh, they make we make them so fast and they are dying and making fast they're trying to help out with your fighting an infection or inflammation red cells I think you know 120 days now keep that in your mind because you know uh, when we talk about uh, the H1AC uh, hemoglobin 1AC that tells us about a diabetic's true uh, commitment to their care and their com compliance with their diet, uh, the red cell catches sugar. I think I've said this before, but it catches sugar. And so uh, it's gonna, that red cell lives 120 days. In 90 days before it dies, they do a hemoglobin H1AC, we call it H1AC, but the H stands for hemoglobin. They run it, and if it's got too much sugar clinging to it, they know that you have not been compliant with watching sugar or carb intake. So 120 days for the red cell. Platelets last uh, a, a 20, uh, 10 days. 10 days. If you get transfused with platelets, they last 24 hours. So kind of keep that in mind. Learn these two terms just because you may have them on tests and you may read them in histories, in, you know, history and physicals. A, the letter A, granulocyte. A, granulocyte. A means without, you know, if you're um, atrophy, a without growth, amenorrhea, no menstruation, the A means without. And monocytes and lymphocytes are white cells that, um, that have no um, gran granulocyte. It's just a physiological term. So if a patient has a has high a gran, gran, A granulocytes. They have high monocytes and lymphocytes. Probably is a virus. So A granulocyte pulls up monocytes and lymphocytes. That's what you need to know. Granulocyte, meaning they have a grain or, or with a center, are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Granulocyte means neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Now I think it's good to keep those two terms and what they really, what of the five do they cover? There's a, 
another term, high, a gran, gran, a granulocytes. They have high monocytes and lymphocytes. Probably is a virus. So a granulocyte pulls up monocytes and lymphocytes. That's what you need to know. Granulocyte, meaning they have a grain or, or with a center, are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Granulocyte means neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Now I think it's good to keep those two terms and what they really, what of the five do they cover? There's a um, another term or two I want you to know. Now we've already talked about hemoglobin and hematocrit, but um, I just want to remind you again that um, we could be fancy with the definition, but some of you have come to me and we've gone over it again. Remember, there is a fancy definition, but hematocrit and hemoglobin are a proportion. And if you want to read it, it's, it's someplace it tells us, um, I could read it to you. Hematocrit are the, are the cells in an ounce of blood. Hemoglobin is in 100 milliliters. Well, you don't want, that's too confusing. So if you'll just remember that they go together, but the proportion is a third. Whatever a hematocrit is, the hemoglobin is a third of it. And that's what I want you to remember. Now, um, there's another term I want you to know, um, the MCV, mean corpuscle volume, mean corpuscle volume. And um, corpuscle is another name for the red blood cell. It tells you the size or the mean size of a red blood cell. And the best way, and I don't have a norm, because you can see it when it comes computerized on that one. That's not one you need to carry around forever. Um, what you do is, um, um, the best way I can describe it is, the red blood cell lives 120 days. And if I were gonna make cookies for the class, and I went to the cupboard the night before, and um, I didn't have enough ingredients to make that, the cookies for 77 people. I just have enough for half of you. Well, I'm gonna still give everybody a cookie, but what, it's gonna be so much smaller. And that is what happens with red cells. If you're bleeding slowly, maybe you just have a little bleed in the GI tract, and you don't even know you've got it but it goes on for six months or whatever, and you begin to look a little more pale, maybe you don't. But when they do your hematocrit and hemoglobin and your hematocrit is down to 28 or 30, mm, they know something's going on. Either your bone marrow's not making it or you're losing it. So they do a mean corpuscle volume, and they see that your red cells are all small. That tells you you've been doing this for at least 120 days because they're all small. Now, um, if you had a bad nosebleed and you went in and your hematocrit was 30, and we don't like an hematocrit at 30, we'd rather it be higher, and they look at your MCV and they're great, they're still big, see, it's just happened. It's a fast bleed versus a slow bleed because they don't shrink. Red cells don't shrivel when you start bleeding. They stay puffy and beautiful, but they send word she's bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. Would you all make them smaller? Because I've still got to get these red cells to the brain and the toe, and I can't just say, I'm just gonna send them partial or serve the class half cookies. You gotta get them everywhere, they've just gotta be smaller. And the four months tells you something. Now, you can also look at the um, uh, size, and if it's a mix, the size of RBC, which is RDW, and um, 
that tells the RDW tells you the size of depending on if you've had a bleed. Sometimes it's a mix. And you, you look at the normal RDW and you see that it's it's not high, it's not the highest, it's actually low. Then you may have a mixture of some big and some small. They all don't do it at the same time because their life dies. They die off. And these are still fluffy, but you, you're making some small ones. So you have blood that has both. Your RDW tells you that. It shows if it's normal, then your blood, all blood cells are gone. If it's high or low, we've got a mix, meaning your bleed probably has been happening uh, within the last four months because they'd all be small if it was, had been going over for, for longer than four months. Again, if you don't understand it, we'll talk about it in class. And um, now, I think I'm ready to talk about disorders. And um, I think that's what I want to do next. So, we'll take anemias first. And you know what anemias are. That's red. We're only dealing. So, we're going to talk about disorders of the red, the white, and the platelets. And anemias are our problems with the red. And I kind of like to... You do not, for test purposes or anything, have to separate, ooh, is this a deficiency or is it a defect in the red cells? But my point is sometimes we're anemic or have low red cells because we either have a deficiency of something, our body does, or our diet is deficient, or we've got a defect in our body that's not making a good red cell. And you don't have to memorize which is which. I don't care. The, nobody else does. You just want to not be anemic. But a few that are specifically uh, defects and uh, are hemolytic anemias. Hemolytic. The red cell just lyses. It doesn't live four days. I mean, four, excuse me, four months. And they're in your book, and you can glance at them. They're not very big, and you don't need to know them in and out. I just want you to know it's anemia. And uh, we've got thalassemia, thalassemia, T-H-A-L-A-S-S-E-M-I-A, -S -S -E thalassemia. And it's an inherited disorder with fragile red blood cells. They just don't live 120 days. It's, it's hereditary or it's inherited and they're just fragile red cells. Thalassemia. When you hear that, you'll know, oh yeah, you're anemic. They got that because your red cells just don't live 120 days. Glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase. Glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase and it's just a defective enzyme that doesn't allow red cells to be produced in the number they should common in women defective enzyme keeps the body from and that's the enzyme uh, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase so the red cells just can't be produced as rapidly um, then we've got sickle cell, pretty famous one, sickle cell, and the red cell, for whatever reason, as a mutation, at certain times that round red cell becomes a half moon. A lot of times it's stress or something, maybe you took some medicine and it made its cycle become a sickle. Uh, it is inherited. It's more prevalent among the African Americans. They feel, they studied it, and you've probably read it too, that it was a mutation that happened to save people from the malaria. And it was a good thing then. If they, anybody was exposed to malaria, the red cells became cycle, sickle, like a half moon, and the person was able to live through that epidemic. Um, 
stress or crisis can make them sickle. Um, the bad thing about sickle cell is that, you know, our red cells go in a, when they get to the capillary, they just do single file. I think of a train going through a tunnel, and I don't care how many trains converge right at the entrance of the tunnel, only one's going to go through at a time, and that's what red cells do. They just become single file at our capillary. Then when they come back out, they can diverge to go back to our heart. So, can you imagine if you're round going through the tunnel versus a half moon going through the tunnel? It gets stuck. And when it, that half moon, that sickle, gets stuck in the capillary, it cannot put out oxygen and bring, out, bring in O2. And, you know, that's what's happening at the capillary level. Letting off, picking up, letting off, pick up. It can't pick up oxygen. It can't let off oxygen and pick up CO2. And so the cell is hurting because it lacks oxygen. You know, they say the reason we have a lot of times pain is because that tissue is not getting oxygen. So sickle cells are in enormous pain. And so we got to do something about their pain. We've got to do something about their oxygen because we're not got to, we don't have a good exchange. So I'm already telling you two big treatments of sickle cell, aren't I? Fluid is the best thing for pushing that IV rate up high. I mean, the doctor has to order it. But a lot of times sickle cell people are on 200, 250 an hour to try to push that fluid to help push that sickle through the tunnel, so to speak through the capillary, and then a lot of oxygen so that the cells that are there are pumped full of oxygen as much as possible, and then a pain medication. So those are your big three treatments for sickle cell that I just need to tell you right off hand. So you get them in your head. Something for pain, because the oxygen is not getting out good enough. Push that through, so high hydration, the pump pushing fluid through fast, and then analgesic. Did I get them all? And oxygen. So, sickle cell. I will tell you, um, because of their on such high narcotics, they get very constipated. And it, they need something to help with that constipation. And a milk and molasses enema is great. It's a one-to-one. -one. Whatever, if it's a half cup to a half cup, or one cup to one cup, but it's a great um, um, enema. Milk and molasses, we keep the molasses on my floor for that. Uh, a narcotic, look in your briefs. I don't think, yeah, I might have it right here. The um, drug, um, we'll talk about it in class. Look in your briefs, there's a drug sub-Q can't remember it. See, I don't give it that much. Uh, the drug that can be given sub-Q that the pharmacist says have them on their bedside commode. And it's for narcotic-induced constipation. You can look in your briefs. We'll talk about it in class. You give it sub-Q, they're on their bedside commode. They will defecate within five minutes. Sometimes it takes a few minutes longer, but it's really an interesting drug. But especially for narcotic-induced constipation. Uh, now, um, deficit, uh, again, a defect can be uh, folic acid deficiency. Um, it, um, folic acid can be a problem with DNA synthesis, so it could be a defect. Folic acid also deficiency might be in diet. It's one of those. That's the reason I said let's don't try to delineate between defects and deficiencies. But folic acid deficiency can be dietary or it could be a defect in the DNA synthesis. Foods that you would could take for folic acid deficiency could be either. In deficiencies, 
iron deficiency anemia is probably the most famous. It's the most common anemia there is. And it's dietary for the most part. Iron deficiency anemia. And you, things they need to eat are dried fruits, because dried fruits are always high in iron. And remember, vitamin C can help that iron get into the tissue. Iron needs vitamin C, vitamin C doesn't need iron. Iron can get there a little bit without it, but vitamin C just gives it a boost. Egg yolks, dried beans, meat, and uh, your best source of vitamin C is the red bell pepper, second source the green bell pepper, and then citrus and some of your other green vegetables. Remember on vitamin C, once again, on vitamin C. It needs to be taken daily. It needs to be dark. So if you keep orange juice, keep it in the refrigerator dark. It needs to be covered and heat will kill it. So you can't cook vitamin C foods and expect that you're getting vitamin C. And we'll talk some more about that in class too, the vitamin C. Um, then another one that has to do with uh, deficiencies is pernicious anemia, pernicious anemia, which is also called B12 deficiency anemia, B12. And the reason it's a defect, or de I'm sorry, a de deficiency, but it could be a defect, you're lacking the intrinsic factor. You say, well, that sounds like a defect. That's the reason I say forget defect and deficiency. But they all come under those umbrellas, but don't try to keep them straight. There's an intrinsic factor, and you may have already studied it, in your GI system that will break down B12. If you don't have that factor, you're not going to break down B12 in your GI tract. If you break down B12 in your GI tract, it gets absorbed in your blood and you're healthy and if you ate a lot of B12 then it would come out in your urine but the point is the word absorbed is absorbed from the GI tract into the bloodstream and that's absorbing and you have to have the intrinsic factor for it to absorb if it doesn't absorb what does B12 do? Well, it might break down, but it's not going to absorb, and it goes into your fecal material. So, there's a test, an important test, called the Schillings test. S-C-H-I-L-L-I-N-G-S, -S, Schillings test. And it, when somebody comes in and they're anemic, mm, all these anemias I just told you, the physician has to decide which one. And so... They look at um, the MCV and it's, they're all low. Everything is peculiar, so they need to run uh, a pernicious anemia, just seeing if they even have this intrinsic factor. And the test, and we can talk about it again in class, but in essence, the patient's given a shot of B12. So that's gonna absorb real fast I mean, not real fast because it's muscular, but it's going to absorb. It's not in your GI fat. It's going to go straight to the muscle, to the um, bloodstream. Then they give them, and it's, it, so it's absorbed. Then they give them a radioactive B12 pills, radioactive. They have them go, it's 2 o'clock, we'll say. They go urinate. They got their shot at two, they took their medicine at two, they urinated at two, and remember, we throw away the, um, the uh, specimen. If you start at two o'clock, that one's thrown away. We have an empty jug that um, is called two o'clock, even though you threw away the clue at two o'clock urine, because it was urine gotten before two o'clock, just reminding you. So it's two o'clock. And during the next 24 hours, you save the urine. At 2 o'clock tomorrow, 
you urinate, put it in the jug, it's sent down to see the radioactive B12 in the urine. Now, if you'll think about it, I got a lot in my shot. They gave me a lot by mouth. If I have the intrinsic factor, then it's going to absorb and I'm going to have and go through my body and excess will go in my urine. So, and this was powerful. I got a lot there. So, I don't need all this B12 that I got because I, I absorbed B12. So, my urine is high in B12, uh, in B12 because it was used. It was used and I had a lot of it. If the shot was all you got, it probably didn't have any excess. And you sure didn't get any in the GI tract. That radioactive B12 went into your fecal matter. It didn't get absorbed. So now, if you don't have the intrinsic factor that breaks down, your urine probably has a normal B12 from the shot or low, if they didn't give you that much B12. So we can talk some more in class, but that's the shillings that tell someone if you have pernicious anemia or lack the intrinsic factor. The next problem that we run into are the white blood cells. Um, and you've already studied, I think in peds, the leukemias. And, and I always say, because we know, White cells, 5,000, 10,000. We've already said how many um, make um, an infection or a raging infection. And if it's more than 30 or 40,000, they question it. That's just a lot. I've seen bad infections at 30,000, but they are always a little suspect when they see them that, that high that it could be. And here's what happens just one day. Nobody knows why leukemia happens particularly. But one day the bone marrow is making fine, and then it just starts pouring out the making of white cells. And it's like you were making cookies. I'm into cookies today. Making cookies, and you lift the mixer up, and the dough flies all over the ceiling and the cabinets and everything. And it's not, there's just, just strings of it and spurts of it, and it's no form. And that's what white cells are like. The bone marrow is just pouring them out every shape. They're worthless, worthless. They'll go up to 100,000. And that's pretty diagnostic for leukemia. You know the four types. You don't necessarily have to distinguish them for me. I just want you to know you have two that are acute and two that are chronic. And one's called acute lymphocytic, lymphocytic and chronic lymphocytic, and then you've got acute uh, monocytic and chronic monocytic. Just, and they attack different age groups, and you probably learned ALL, uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia in peds, and um, that's probably the best prognosis. They just use a lot of combinations of drugs, and um, uh, they um, might give uh, antibodies. Um, so there's all kinds of combinations. Yeah, why why did it happen? Nobody knows. Uh, what will keep? What will cure it? They just try to give chemo or something, an immunoglobulin. Um, which is kind of an antibody, not kind of, an immunoglobulin, to try to calm down the bone marrow, interfere with that making, and see if the bone marrow will stop uh, going crazy. So those are things they just try to work, but as you've already studied leukemia, uh, just know that nobody knows how this happens, and nobody will talk some more in class and nobody knows what to do about it. We have all kinds of drugs that try to arrest it and put it in remission. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But the different kinds, uh, chronic means long life, acute usually means pretty 
quickly takes your life. Multiple myeloma is kind of, it's lymphatic kind of problem with white cells. And the lymph system kind of goes with our white blood problems. And it's a problem of bone marrow and tumors in the bone marrow. Um, it's usually, um, then you have pain. I want you to keep the, there's some names I want you to keep in, some things to keep in mind with multiple myeloma. Uh, it's diagnosed through a Vince, B-E-N-C-E hyphen Jones, Vince Jones test, which is a 24-hour urine again, and it is checking calcium and protein levels because when this tumor starts happening, when this problem starts happening, pours out calcium and protein. And so, usually uh, chemo is given to try to shrink the tumors. You can imagine the pain with multiple myeloma when bones, when you've got bone lesions. Lesion, another word for tumor. So, I want you to think hypercalcemia. I want you to think of um, pain. I want you to think Vince Jones test. And then your book brings up CRAB. It's the only place I've seen it used, but it's a good, good definition. C-R-A-B. It says high calcium for the C. Renal insufficiency. The kidneys just can't get all that calcium out. You're anemic because your bone marrow is busy doing things it shouldn't do. And you've got bone lesions. B for bone lesions. C-R-A-B. Um, lymphoma is the next white type, white type uh, problem, and we have two types, non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's. And uh, the difference is really in the type cell that's in the tumors. They're lymphomas. They're in the lymph system. Tumors in the lymph system. And about all I'd like for you to know is the words. Um, Reed, R-E-E-D, hyphen Sternberg, S-T-E-R-N, Berg, B-E-R-G. And they're cells that are found in Hodgkin's. If somebody feels a lump, oh, it's probably in my lymph system, and they biopsy and it has the Reed-Steinberg cells, it's probably Hodgkin's. If it isn't, it's non-Hodgkin's or lymphoma. Neither one of them are great. Um, I really think and it's my opinion, Hodgkin's have a better prognosis. Lymphomas, all of them are not good because they're, they're tumors in the lymph system that begin to press against nerves and, and press against vital organs. And that's their problem. They just get bigger and have to be removed. They usually divide them into four stages. I think it's kind of interesting to know. You don't have to necessarily for a test, but stage one is um, you find a node, uh, one node in the lymphatic system, wherever. Stage two, uh, more than one node on the same side of the body, upper or lower. They're, I found two nodes and they're both upper. Stage three is uh, nodes are on both sides, but they're not big and they're not many. I don't know what not big and not many mean, but that's what. Stage four, there are nodes everywhere, tumors everywhere. And now we're to disorders of the pla of platelets. And um, People are considered, you know normal platelets, I think we said 100,000 uh, to 450,000 or something like that, 100,000 to 400, in those ballparks of 400,000, uh, starting at 100,000. Anything under 100,000, somebody is considered thrombocytopenic, they're low, low platelets. And if they're, they're high risk for bleeding, they bumped up to somebody and bled or accidentally cut and bled. Uh, high risk for bleeding are at 50,000 or lower. And spontaneously bleeding, when you just start bleeding, you're just sitting here listening to me and you some of them are great. 
um, I really think, and it's my opinion, Hodgkin's have a better prognosis. Lymphomas, all of them are not good because they're, they're tumors in the lymph system that begin to press against nerves and, and press against vital organs, and that's their problem. They just get bigger and have to be removed. They usually divide them into four stages. I think it's kind of interesting to know. You don't have to necessarily for a test, but stage one is um, you find a node, uh, one node in the lymphatic system, wherever. Stage two, uh, more than one node on the same side of the body, upper or lower. They're, I found two nodes and they're both upper. Stage three is uh, nodes are on both sides, but they're not big and they're not many. I don't know what not big and not many mean, but that's what. Right. Stage four, there are nodes everywhere, tumors everywhere. And now we're to disorders of the pla of platelets. And um, People are considered, you know normal platelets, I think we said 100,000 uh, to 450,000 or something like that, 100,000 to 400, in those ballparks of 400,000, uh, starting at 100,000. Anything under 100,000, somebody is considered thrombocytopenic, they're low, low platelets. And if they're, they're high risk for bleeding, they bumped up to somebody and bled or accidentally cut and bled. Uh, high risk for bleeding are at 50,000 or lower. And spontaneously bleeding, when you just start bleeding, you're just sitting here listening to me and you start bleeding either in the head or your body and you're bleeding, that can happen from 20,000 or lower. And I don't know whether you all have noticed, sometimes the orders will say anything under 10,000 going in transfuse platelets. And in CDM, I'm going to go over the hanging of platelets in blood. Um, you already know they last, like uh, platelets last 10 days. If you're transfused, only 24 hours. Now, some of our problems are, again, hemophilia hemophilia, you're lacking two of those 13 clotting factors. And uh, you don't need to even, it's clotting factor eight and nine, but you don't need to know that. Uh, it's sex linked, women carry it, but it mostly affects men and our uh, males. And um, it bleeds in the joint, so it's loaded with pain. Hemophilia is heavy bleeding in the joints, loaded with pain. Von, B-O-N, Willebrand is another problem with platelets, and it's the, uh, they are only missing number eight. You don't need to remember what one they're missing, but it is only one clotting factor is missing. And they don't bleed in their joints. And um, they have bruising, and they have hematomas, nosebleeds, heavy menstruation for women, but uh, it's very livable. The next one is ITP, idiopathic, idio, I-D-I-O-pathic, thrombocytopenia purpura. So idiopathic um, is, they don't know where it comes from, thrombocytopenia low purpura. Do you know purpura is kind of, uh, bleeding that goes together and looks like a birthmark. So they may have petechiae so close and um, together that the bleeding goes together to look like a birthmark. The, w, the platelets are below 100,000 and what it is is an autoimmune problem. It's the craziest thing somebody wakes up, it's a lot among young college people uh, of that age, and people think it's the flu. They wake up not feeling good. Yeah, I've noticed I have a few bruises, but I was hit. You know, somebody came up and did that to me. 
they justify. But then they wake up one day really feeling bad. So they go to the college infirmary or wherever. They do blood work and realize that um, platelets are real low. You know, the first scare is leukemia. Let me stop to say, why? Leukemia is high white. We're not talking about platelets. Well, if your bone marrow, follow me, if your bone marrow is pouring out white, it's not pouring out platelets in red. So leukemics a lot of times go to the doctor because they're anemic, they're tired, and they're bruising. Well, because their red is down and their platelets are down, not because they're diseased, the bone marrow isn't putting it out because it's so busy putting out white. So when anybody goes in with bruising, the, the office, doctor's office is usually worried until they get that blood work back on ITP and the blood work shows platelets are low, okay, but white and red are normal. And it's, everybody leaves, do is a sigh of relief because that means it's a thrombocytopenic problem and probably autoimmune. And the craziest thing is that it'll leave as crazy as it came. They do treat it. Um, they may give steroids. Do you recall on your in your briefs, it has steroids and it says coats uh, platelets. Um, steroids will coat platelets. Physicians may or may not give the patient steroids. And and just a just an elementary way of saying it is that that steroid covers the platelet that has an antibody on it. What happens, stop and say, somebody wakes up one morning and the body says, my goodness, I don't think those platelets belong to me. They don't look like what I used to have and makes an antibody for it. And that's as crazy as autoimmune is. Autoimmune is just that crazy. One morning you wake up and the body doesn't think it recognizes something and starts fighting its own self. And so it makes an antibody to kill the platelet. But that antibody doesn't kill the platelet. The platelet still does fine until it goes through the spleen. And you remember from anatomy and physiology, the spleen, besides making us some cells, it's real good color or a filter or pulling bad things out and crushing them and keeping them and letting the good pass through. So when that monstrosity passes through the spleen, the spleen says, my goodness, that's an odd looking thing, I'm gonna kill it. It kills it. The spleen gets bigger and bigger and bigger because of all the old cells, which is exactly what happens in leukemics when that white cell is coming through that doesn't look right, it kills it. And one of the symptoms when anybody's got leukemia is they have a huge spleen because the destroyed white cells are in there. Can't keep up with it, of course. Anyway, so back to the platelet, and I know I'm going back and forth, but it's the comparison. So here's the platelet. Sometimes steroids given will cover it. I tell it kind of greases it, and they can get past the spleen because there's nothing wrong with the platelet. It's just that it's carrying a worthless antibody. Now the physician might do that, doesn't keep them on steroids for about six weeks because you know constant steroids are a little hard on us. So, um, 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 it might can kill them. If it doesn't, they may give them uh, an antibody. I want you to realize antibodies come in IV solutions as IgG, IgA, Ig. They're a big I, capital, lowercase g, and then a capital G, maybe. There are different antibodies that we can be given IV, and they'll give an antibody hoping that antibody they're given IV will kill that ridiculous antibody right in the platelets. So we've got steroids that might can help ITP. We've got antibodies IV. And then um, they may have to do a splenectomy just to get the spleen out so the spleen won't keep killing the platelets. And it leaves the body, it quits 
as autoimmunes will do if they don't kill you first, autoimmunes wake up one day and say, oh, I made a mistake. I do recognize this platelet. And they quit doing what they were doing. Um, I do want to mention one that's real odd. It's real, um, it's rare, I should say. TTP, TTP, thrombo, thrombocytopenia purpura. And it is just, again, kind of an autoimmune. All of a sudden, the body starts clumping their, their thrombus the, at the capillaries uh, and the, and the um, arteries. They just kind of clump together and plate this clump. And when they do that, our circulating good thrombus are not up to... 100,000 to fourth the 100,000. Um, the treatment for that is anti anticoagulants. But TTP, you don't see it very often. Sometimes it's confused with ITP because they both show low platelets and regular uh, red and white. And you know it's a thrombocytopenia purpura and they're bruising. But uh, we've had patients, they first say are ITP, and then when they get here and see the microscopic uh, platelets clumping, they know it's TTP. The last platelet problem is DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And that, um, you look in your book, but let me tell you about it first and just listen. They don't know why it starts. It's not called an autoimmune, it's just called crazy. And it just, they don't know why it happens. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. And uh, um, the best way I can describe to you is it's the body with clotting and, and bleeding going on at the same time. Not at the same place, different places, clotting, bleeding, going on at the same time in the body. Now, is that crazy? They don't know when it's going to happen or why it's going to happen. And I'll talk to you about a couple of examples when we go to class. But, um, but I, I made this example up myself. If I hadn't really been among the Amish people, but I've seen movies and read books, and I, what they say is they all live in the community, and when there's a fire or a, something happening way over on that farm, they ring a bell. And all the able-bodied men drop their pitchforks or whatever they're doing and rush to that farm to help and leave the women and children at home. And then they get up there and every man in the area is there. They're all over each other, falling on each other. Every, it's, it's craziness. But nobody's back home and the wolves attack the children and there's no protection at home. And so in the body, what happens, one crazy time, something happens in the body. And it could be an injury, a trauma, or it could be the gram negative rods. But something happens that everything worth anything to stop it, except go to that area and leave the rest of the body unprotected. And so they're clotting at the area because they're all over each other, in each other's way, stomping on each other, sticking to each other. So we got clotting there, we got bleeding someplace else. Nobody knows why it happens, it just happens. And I'll give you some examples of it uh, in class when we talk about it. But in essence, it's bleeding and clotting going on at the same time. You think, which would we, would we uh, treat first? Well, they get heparin in you or an anticoagulant. There's also, your book mentions APC, which is activated protein C. And um, um, so an anticoagulant and, of course, blood replacement if you're losing blood. If you're, it's a trauma that brings on. Um, but it may be um, a gram-negative rod, and they give an anticoagulant plus something to fight the rod. DIC, we'll talk more about it. Now, 
what's left to talk about. Um, so an anticoagulant and, of course, blood replacement if you're losing blood. If you're, it's a trauma that brings on. Um, but it may be um, a gram-negative rod, and they give an anticoagulant plus something to fight the rod. DIC, we'll talk more about it. Now, what's left to talk about are, of course, the tests. We're going to start that next test. But what makes any of these problems? You know, I told you what is wonderful, and then I told you disorders. What makes the disorders? Well, we mentioned hereditary, trauma, uh, chemicals can do it, drugs can do it, autoimmune can do it, infection can do it, uh, antagonizing agents. All those things can throw our bone marrow into not acting properly or throw our red cells, white cells, platelets to where they're not operating properly. The tests, and we've already talked about most of them, let's just list them. Shillings, you all review that, intrinsic factor, 24-hour urine, um, and it's for pernicious anemia. Lymph node biopsies. The guaiac test, G-U-I-A-C, or uh, the hidden blood occult blood test that can tell if fecal material has blood in it. We'll know it's GI bleeding or whatever. So occult or guaiac testing. Uh, the bench Jones. We mentioned that, which is going to check our calcium and protein for um, multiple myeloma. D-dimer, didn't mention it, but D-dimer tells us if we've got a D-dimer rate, it's usually because we've got a coagulation problem. Of course, MRIs are used to check for tumors. CTs are big for checking our liver and our spleen scans. And you know those lymph node biopsies I mentioned, especially for Hodgkin's and Reed Steinberg and so forth. The differential is going to check all those five uh, white cells. PT, which is prothrombin time, and, and what do we have on our card? 10 seconds on our laminated card. And then PTT, 20 to 40 seconds. I think we said 39 on our card. And INR, I think, what, 0 0.5 to 1.25 or 1.5, whatever your card says. I have some that I've used for years, but the card's fine. They're all close. Um, and um, here's the deal on INR or... Um, PTT, PT, any of those. If you know what it should be, if it's taking longer, then it's, ta you're, it's taking you longer to clot. That's the deal. If it's lower, you're clotting quick. And so something is going to make you clot, and we don't want to clot quick because that means clots. So whenever you uh, are looking at these times, you need to do the thinking yourself. Ooh, if it's way up, it's taking me a long time. Something, I'm bleeding too easily. That's what you're talking to yourself about. I think the term physicians say a control is what it should be. And what is your PT or PTT? And it, they say about two times, it used to be two to three times the control is okay if they wanted it that way. You and I don't want to walk around that way, but if they're fearful of a stroke or something, they want it two to three times that control. Now, I know these physicians stop an anticoagulant when it's about one and a half over. They'll give an anticoagulant, Coumadin, heparin, until it's about one and a half, and then they may stop it. They just don't want the person clotting the whole point. Bone marrow aspirations are used. We look at CBCs and CBCs and differentials. 
Uh, sedimentation rate, I didn't mention sed rate, S-E-D rate or sedimentation rate. And it, it's high when uh, an inflammation is happening. Uh, it could be an infection or just inflammation. It just, I always think everything good is running to try to help and there's a lot of sediment. That's the way I remember it. CRP is a precursor of sedimentation rate. A lot of people uh, think CRP has to do with heart, and it does. It, so often we look at CRPs with the heart, but a lot of times it's looking at the inflammation of the heart, but it can also look at inflammation of other areas too. I just want you to realize, and that's most of the tests, that's not too many. Uh, what can increase, I talked about increasing clotting time where they go higher, and aspirin can increase it, clotting times. When I say clotting times, INR, PGT, PT, D-dimer, all those. Aspirin, antibiotics, sometimes meds can, like Aleve, Advil, Pepto-Bismol, and Excedrin all increase our clotting time. You know that. You knew aspirin did that. Fresh fruits, peppermint, curry powder, prunes, they'll all increase it. Do I mean much? Not a lot, unless you're excessive. Now, some things decreased will make us clot too soon. And we don't want a lot of clotting too soon, just like we don't want to bleed out either. And acids can make us, can decrease clotting times. Valium barbiturates, oral contraceptives, laxatives, and then some foods like milk, eggs, broccoli, cauliflower, beef, pork, and spinach. Now, treatments, we've already talked, we've kind of interspersed treatments, but let's just list them. Transfusions, blood transfusions, platelet transfusions, plasma transfusions, you know what's in plasma. And let me ask you, if you do plasma, I might ask it, we'll talk about it in class, but if you're doing plasma, is it for the 98% water? Don't think so. Is it for fibrinogen? I, we can give fibrinogen by itself. Is it for gamma globulin? That's antibodies. Is it for albumin? We can give albumin by itself. Fibrinogen is really the reason when I said we give it by itself. It, the real best way fibrinogen comes is as plasma. So we didn't need it for water. We didn't particularly need it for albumin because we can give a bottle of albumin. And we don't need it for gamma globulin. We can give antibodies. Fibrinogen really does best coming as the plasma. That's the main reason usually you give plasma. So if you have to give plasma at the hospital, surprise your instructor and be so good and say, I know it's for pl plasma. It's probably for my fibrinogen. Because you really, I said, it comes in a little bottle. It comes as the plasma. Another treatment are B12 foods vitamin C, iron, folic acid foods. Then um, uh, infrarod, infrarod, which is iron. And remember, infrarod, we give z track where you push the muscle over, give the injection, come on out, and push your tissue back over it, making a z. Um, so, infrarod or iron is done z track Heparin, we'll give that as an anticoagulant. Remember, if it's 5,000 units, probably it's prophylactic. If it's bigger than that, like 25,000 units in a 250 bag, it's probably because they have an active clot that we want to need to get rid of. Warfarin or Coumadin. W-A-R-F-A-R-I-N or Coumadin, aspirin, 
may be given. Uh, now, then three drugs, I want you to learn them good. Procrit, which is erythropoietin. It's in your briefs, I think. Sub-Q shot, about $500. It will boost the bone marrow to make red cells. It's also called epigen. Epigen. E-P-O-G-E-N. We've got new mega. New, N-E-U, mega. Sub-Q, $500. Boosts the bone marrow to make platelets. Then we've got leukine, L-E-U-K-I-N-E, -E, also called neupogen, new, N-E-U, you know means white, neupogen, and also the GSCF, GSCF, growth stimulating, growth stimulating colony factor. It's just, again, sub-Q, $500, and it boosts white cells. Of course, we can give whole blood, but where do we give it? E-R-O-R -R for whole blood, because we want everything. But if we're in the upstairs oncology unit, then we probably just want the red cells. We don't need the plasma. Um, let's see if there's any more... Imuran, I-M-U-R-O-N, is an immunosuppressant. A lot of times given to try to keep antibodies down, push antibodies down, because they're attacking something, especially autoimmune. Um, and I believe those are the medicines I want you. Desferol, we need that one. D E S. F-E-R-A-L, Desferol. And Desferol is D-E, like dehydration, dehydration, take out fluid. Well, Desferol is D-E, Fersol, F-E-R-S-O-L. Iron. D-E, take out iron. You know, when you get your red cells break down in 120 days, and we reuse the iron over and over. And if you get in transfusions through this blood problems, then your iron is building up so high and they need to get rid of it because it's not good. So they use this drug Desferol and it'll get rid of the iron. It is P-O or I-V. Now, I want you to remember natural diuretics. We've got some more and I'll bring them up in class, some more natural diuretics. But cucumbers and asparagus, are natural diuretics, teach the patients that. And natural antibiotics are vitamin C. And there's some more of those we'll look at. You can always, of course, Google too. If you're trying to teach your patient, just Google that as well. I think that's gonna complete the lecture on hematology. But in class, we'll clear up things and um, hope have some fun, okay?